thing. Nephi is actually playing the role here of the Passover angel of death. Yeah. And like, whoa, and he that, just got so much more <laughs> BA. That needs to be inscribed on those armbands. There was a chick version of T. Ancum that looked a lot like Zoe Saldana. <laughs> oh my you know God. what I'm saying? <laughs> Girl Ops and Q-Mobs were dragons! They're yes! Dragons. <laughs> Joseph Smith didn't just come up with the Book of Mormon on his own here. But the, who would get the comment? Like, who would get, and there was like an affidavit somewhere that somebody wrote that he was a bad person. That we actually did have a manuscript. All kinds of other evidences that all point to the Book of Mormon is starting at Passover. Wait, so you know a legit story that was in the lost 116 pages, and I'm still sitting through my 15th iteration of the stupid Thomas B. Marsh bucket of cream story? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to Ward Radio. I'm your host, Cardinals, and I'm joined in the studio by a superstar cast. We've got Don Bradley, who is author of none other than The Lost 116 Pages. Oh, that's just a shabby paperback. I got my hardcover right here, Don. Oh, you yeah. know, I have the original plates right here, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> the manuscript that, that, of the 116 pages. That's funny. Pages. That's funny. We also got Sean <laughs> Bailey, Brad Whitbeck, and Josh Gailey joining us, all authors at large. And today, we're actually going to talk about the lost 116 pages a book that i have to tell you if you follow us on twitter or on instagram i posted several weeks ago i personally am devouring and i have not been as intrigued by a book and as riveted to uh, a book about the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints and tangentially our bicker tonight brothers here on yeah. the left um i haven't been riveted to a book like this since richard bushman's rough stone rolling so I'm devouring this thing piece by piece. Um, so we had to get uh, Don Bradley here to talk about uh, the man, the mystery, the wonder, and everything that is the lost 116 pages. So um, why don't we just start out? You can introduce yourself, tell us who you are, and then what's the coolest thing from the lost 116 pages that you were able to put together? So just tell us about yourself, the book, and then the cool stories that everybody missed because they weren't paying attention until you came along and wrote the book. <laughs> So I'm Don Bradley. I'm a historian. P.S. Cool tat that you're unironically <laughs> showing off right there, oh, bro. Okay. What is that, dog? This stands for the transformation of the human into the divine or the material into the spiritual. Oh, awesome. It, in the Renaissance, it was known as squaring the circle. Uh-huh. And was connected oh. with the, the symbol for the philosopher's stone. And that's oh, yeah. all over the temple, right? There, there are symbols. Yes, yeah, nice. similar symbols. Yes. Yeah. See, I was hoping it was some kind of cool, like, you know, gang tat that you got in prison or something. That, but, like, it, I mean, it's that too. Theosis <laughs> is divine as well. Garden so, has one of those, but he can't like show this. it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for real. So, anyway, um, lost 116 pages, bro. Tell us all about it, man. Sure. So, um, everybody, if you grow up LDS uh, in primary, you hear about how. Justice Smith lends this manuscript of 116 pages to Martin Harris and then never gets it back. And so everybody knows that there were 116 lost pages, but nobody knows anything about them, like what was in them. And so I remember being 11 years old in primary, teacher was teaching us about this, and I just was dumbfounded that, you know, the Book of Mormon is so foundational to Latter-day Saint faith that the idea that we're missing part of that foundation stone, right? It was just mind blowing to me as a kid. Mm. And I remember asking the teacher what what was in them. Yeah. And of course, nobody knew. Um, and so Did in adult life, <laughs> in adult life, I became interested in this question more because I wanted to understand, first of all, it's a great mystery, right? So for me, doing history is solving mysteries. It's detective work, right? So it's kind of like, all of our witnesses are dead, but they left behind clues and Ooh. testimonies. And it falls to us to piece together the clues that they left behind, like puzzle pieces, right? Yeah. Figure yeah. out what yeah. is it a picture yeah. of. Mm -hmm. And so um, I it, partly it's just a mystery, but partly also I wanted to understand the part of the Book of Mormon text that we do have. So let me give you an idea of what we're missing. Okay, mm -hmm. we, we say 116 pages. But like how much of the history is actually gone? 
So a lot of people know the Lost Pages as the Book of Lehi, right? That term has been used for it. Yeah. Apparently just referring actually to one of the books, like the first book that was in the Lost Manuscript about Lehi. Yeah. But the um, the small, the Lost Manuscript of the Book of Mormon, after it was stolen, it's ultimately replaced by the small plates of Nephi. And those small plates, we know, cover four and a half centuries. Yeah. Okay. So that tells us how much we're missing from the lost pages of Mormon's abridgment, right? The first 450 years of it. Now, when Mormon condenses the history of the Nephites, does his abridgment, right? He covers the first 600 years up till Christ, and then he covers the next 320 years until he was a child and he begins not abridging other people's record, but telling his own story, right? So you put those together, that's about 900 years well, 450 years is exactly half of 900. Oh, yeah. So we are missing the first half of Mormon's abridgment. So take any mm. book, right? Take take my book, take the books that you guys have written, rip out the first half. Ah. Then create, just have somebody do just like a short summary in a few pages of that first half, and then try reading the second half and see how much sense it makes, right? You will be, you will get a lot of it, but you will be missing a lot that the author intended you to get. Mm -hmm. And so this was what started me looking into what can we know about what was in those lost pages? Because I want to understand the Book of Mormon text that we do have. So that means we have to figure out something about what was in those lost pages, right? And so how do you write a book about a lost book? <laughs> yeah, right? This, this on, is yeah. a question that I gotten from a lot of people when I was working on it. They were like, wouldn't that have to be a really short book? You know? Uh -huh. And in fact, as you can see, no, not really. <laughs> um, yeah. It ended up being much longer than I expected. Yeah. I, I originally was joking that I was going to try to make it exactly 116 pages. And then <laughs> yeah. it just, the thing grew. Two you know? volumes of it, 116 <laughs> pages, right? Yeah. And so we can piece together some of what was in those lost pages in part because we have the part of the Book of Mormon text that we do have, right? Mm -hmm. if, if we were missing the entire book, obviously it would be much harder, the entire Book of Mormon, to reconstruct things from yeah. it. But because we have the rest of the book where Mormon picked up his narrative after those lost pages, and then we have the, the small plates that replace those lost pages, that gives us a lot of clues to go from just there. Mm -hmm. right? So there are references in the Book of Mormon text that we have like, um, excuse me, where it talks about uh, in Alma 10, about there's this guy, there was this guy, Aminadi, who had interpreted the writing that was on the uh, wall of the temple. Yeah, the wall of the, the temple, that's of epic. God, right? Yeah. This sounds totally epic, right? This is like Daniel is interpreting Amulek's the writing. Grandpa, uh, right? Amulek's like or great, 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 great ancestor. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we know that he lived a long time before Amulek, right? But a descendant of Nephi right. zone. Right, right. So and this sounds totally epic, right? Like like God writing on his finger with his finger on those stone tablets up on Sinai, right? But, or Daniel uh, interpreting right. writing in the for the Babylonians, bingo, right? Mm -hmm. So why why do we just have this little m later mention as if we should already know about this? Well, you know, it's the he says it was the same Amenadi who had interpreted the writing by the finger of God on the wall of the temple. Well, the same Amenadi that means. You're supposed to already know who Amenadi is. This is right. supposed to be a familiar story. Yeah. Well, the reason is that that story was in the lost pages of the Book of Mormon. And so then we don't have the full story, but we have a reference back to it. But that re be that reference back to it becomes one of our clues mm. to what was in the lost pages. Well, we know there's a story about this Amenadi guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. when, when Chemish was like writing things down, I was like, yeah. Not much to see here, you know, in the book Jerem, of Mormon. Jerem is like the most disappointing prophet. He's like, yeah, <laughs> we had lots of revelations and uh, I'm not going to bother writing them down. I, just, yeah. I don't care. So I got a question for you. One of the sure. things that intrigued me um, when one of my buddies was in his process of going and active and reading the CES letter and still thinking that a thin veneer of academia that lacks the verifiability thereof was actually a legitimate piece of uh, science. Um I remember we were talking about Temple Scroll Q Q11, and and what I love, and we talked about the nature of epistemology, how you can know things, okay? Sure. And and I, I just love how so many times, just like Indiana Jones having to walk and step onto the unseeable bridge as his proverbial act of faith was rewarded physically after the mm -hmm. display of his faith in his mm -hmm. father's notebook, right? 
Um, I think oftentimes the Lord kind of wants faith first and then rewards physical evidence second. And one of those big examples was when they found Temple Scroll Q11, which was pro- most likely written by the Essenes and had a lot of the subsets and a lot of the um, exceptions to the rules in the law of Moses uh, as they perceived um, that refuted a lot of anti-Mormon claims in the first, you know, 10 pages of the Book of Mormon. When Lehi makes a three days journey outside of Jerusalem, he builds an altar, offers sacrifices of gravi- sure. gratitude. And a lot of people back then said, oh, this is completely this is garbage. There's no way the law of Moses would permit this. Yeah, yeah this and that. And they, they just discredited the book for science. Mm-hmm. Right. Because that was against um, everything they knew about the law of Moses at the time. Fast forward, the Nag Hammadi library is found, the library at Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls at large are found. And all of a sudden, all of these kind of exceptions to those rules by these varying sects are discovered. And one of them on Temple Scroll Q11 said, if you're more than a three days journey away from uh, the city of Jerusalem, not only are you allowed to, but you're expected to make uh, sacrifices of gra- gratitude. And the reason why was simply mathematical. If you're three days out, you're also three days in. And in a six days journey, if you had to go back to Jerusalem in order to make your uh, burnt offerings, you would run the risk of uh, falling upon thieves or bad weather, weather and would thus be violating the Sabbath. So three days out, you should actually offer burnt offerings. And there's no way Joseph Smith could have known this mm-hmm. when he was translating the Book of Mormon. But for the people that had taken Moroni's promise and had a spiritual experience with the Book of Mormon and known of its truthfulness and stuck along, they ultimately were rewarded with physical evidence afterwards, right? Are there any uh, apocryphal stories found in the lost gospel of Thomas or Philip or these millions of gospels they're finding in the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Are there any other... um, uh, uh, like just like there used to be Josephus and Tertullian and you know all these other uh, secular historical writers and and founding fathers, are there any other apocryphal stories in any other lost books that have matched anything that was in like the lost 116 pages where you think oh these two things mm. are correlating just like Temple Scroll Q11 correlated with uh, those first chapters in the Book of Mormon. Well, one thing that I can think of, not exactly that, but like you're probably somewhat familiar with the work of biblical scholar Margaret Barker. Mm -hmm. I've heard the name. She makes arguments about what Israelite religion looked like before the Babylonian exile, before the Babylonians came and kicked butt and, you know, like shipped the Israelites, the Jews out. Burnt out the Um, eyeballs of Uzziah. Right, right, right. Which is actually right where the Book of Mormon starts, right? Immediately yeah. before that. Yeah. Right? And I, and I want to come back to that. Um, so um, in her work, she talks about what their religion looked like, how there was a sort of a concept of a divine feminine and other things, right? And there was like a greater freedom for people to do sacrifices outside of the temple and so on. And what we can see in the Book of Mormon, and particularly what can be pieced together from the Lost Pages, actually supports that. It actually, Israelite religion, as it's presented in the Book of Mormon and the particularly what we can know of the Lost Pages, Mm -hmm. seems to match Israelite religion before the Exile, particularly before the reform of Josiah, which was during the lifetime Mm -hmm. of Lehi. So something that emerges as we look at the stories that we can reconstruct from the Lost Pages that adds some weight to the Book of Mormon and like actually reframes kind of what the Book of Mormon is about has to do with there's actually a kind of festival, Jewish festival context for the opening events of the Book of Mormon. Oh, rock on. Hit it. So, okay. Mm. So... I mentioned that some of the clues that we have are in the Book of Mormon text. We've also got uh, early revelations that allude to things that were in the Lost Pages, and we've got accounts where people talk about it. So you've got, in 1856, Emer Harris, brother of Martin Harris, he came out here to Utah as a pioneer. He's giving a talk at a state conference, and he's talking about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, and he says, I will now tell you some of the things that were in the pages that were lost. Well, how would he know this? Well, he's Martin Harris's brother. Martin Harris is the scribe for the Lost Pages. And Emer Harris, direct ancestor of Dallin Harris Oaks, by the way. Who's that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my bestie. He's my bestie. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So he he gives a little bit about how the Mulekites escaped from the Babylonians. He says that Mulek wasn't alone. There were several 
women. There were four men and four women from the royal household who hid from the Babylonians, and they were able to make their way out of the area, right, oh, wow. and escape to the New World. Um, Wait, so you know a legit story that was in the lost 116 pages, and I'm still sitting through my 15th iteration of the stupid Thomas B. Marsh bucket of cream story <laughs> when when I go to freaking Sunday school? Like, can we substitute church office building person in charge of the manuals? Get rid of that 15th version of the Thomas B. Marsh bucket of cream story. And what did you just do, Josh? What did you just do? Right over my head. Right yeah, over yeah, my head. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this is a Brighamite cultural thing, all right? <laughs> but there's this guy, Thomas B. Marsh, that supposedly got so offended about something having to do with a bucket of cream. They, like, went inactive. How can and you not remember it was milk strippings after hearing it this many times, Cardi? Yeah, but just, like, because I tune out the second I hear, okay, don't be like Thomas B. Marsh and be so prideful that you'll lose your membership of the church over milk strippings. It you know sounds delicious. Delicious. Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. a delicious way to apostatize. Yeah. You know? So, man, let's let let's switch out what you know Mulek was doing with the secret society of 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 lady assassins or whatever it was that you were about to say. Yeah, just dial this I would. I would. I was just one, pumping, right? punching up the story. You know what I'm saying? Like there was right. a chick version of Tiancum that looked a lot like Zoe Saldana. <laughs> oh my you know God. what I'm saying? In, in oh, like, you, yeah. you don't even need to read the rest of the book. You've already got <laughs> it. Yeah. You just just like, the ending. I'm buying the rights to that. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Eva Longoria and Zoe Saldana are now the the the, the, the two Nephitesses Go or whatever, good you know? So, so, so one of the stories we've got from what was in the last page is one of our sources, Joseph Smith's father, Joseph Smith Sr., okay, so he's interviewed in 1830 before the Book of Mormon comes off the press. There's just a local guy. He's actually a cousin to the Martin Harris family. Mm -hmm. He comes to the Smith home. He's like, hey, I want to find out about this book, but I can't read it yet. There's just a Smith Sr. tells this guy, Fayette Lapham, he tells him about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, all kinds of details, some of which are garbled, but some that we can confirm from other sources that he wouldn't have had. And then he starts telling the story in the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. And this is where it gets interesting, right? Because at first, he's just like telling the story that we have, that we all know, where there's this prophet in ancient Israel, and God warned him to go out into the wilderness and take his family so they wouldn't be destroyed. And they journey out three days toward the Red Sea, and, you know, they're led by this ball, and so on, right? But he says um, in the process, he's talking about the brass plates, like the guy sends his son back. He only remembers one son, but the guy sends his son back. And the son is going to get uh, this record that someone else has. And he, like, uh, finds the guy drunk in the street after the guy won't at first give him the record. He takes out his sword. He even remembers the part about, like, how he's struck by the how beautiful the hilt of the sword was. Mm -hmm. Well, he adds to this that a reason why the guy was drunk. Mm -hmm. Now, our Book of Mormon text doesn't say why he was drunk. Right? It, it did says, say he hung out with the elders of the Jews. Right, which right. I'll come back to, right? So it doesn't, but it doesn't say why he was drunk specifically, right? So this guy says, uh, Joseph Smith Sr. says, this guy, that Laban was drunk because there was a great feast going on oh. at Jerusalem at oh. the time, like a religious festival. Yeah. Right? Do we know which one? That's the good question, right? So um, this isn't in our Book of Mormon text, but it would fit, right? Because Laban wasn't just out with drinking buddies. He is out with the elders of the Jews. There's a religious context here, right? I mean, if you're out drinking with the elders of the Jews, those are some high-profile drinking buddies, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, he's also pretty dang dressed up to go out drinking. Yeah, wearing right? his armor. This he, sounds like a Church of Jesus Christ story, not necessarily a Word of Wisdom story. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yes. So he, he's, got, he's got armor. He's got a sword. Why is this sounds pretty formal. He's not drinking. Mm -hmm. uh, when his so do you servant, think his armor was ceremonial then? Yeah. Like a, interesting. So, so there are other things in the text that would fit with this being a ceremonial festival mm -hmm. context. So then the question, well, what was the festival? Yeah. Right. So when um, he gets back out into the world, well, right before Nephi comes back from the wilderness, Lehi does a sacrifice. Right after he gets back, Lehi does a sacrifice, which mm. again suggests there, there could be a festival context, right? Ah. And remember, Lehi's journey here is like an exodus, 
right? He's like other people have noticed. Lehi is like Moses. He's leading his people through the wilderness to the promised land. They call it. well, that's that's the language of the Exodus. Lehi is a new Moses. Oh wow! How does the Exodus start? What is the event Passover. that kicks off Passover? Yeah. Yes, right? Yes. When the Egyptians finally let the Israelites go, they let them go at Passover, right? Well, well, Nephi. When he is talking to his brothers about Laban, he compares Laban to the Egyptians. Yeah. Remember that? Right? Yeah. He compares Laban to the Egyptians. And so we have uh, an Exodus Passover context. And in fact, he talks about how the Egyptians, were, Laban will be destroyed like the Egyptians were destroyed at the Red Sea. Mm-hmm. Well, in Jewish tradition, like the eighth day of Passover celebrates the parting of the Red Sea, right? So. All of this fits with a context of Passover. When Lehi is talking to his sons after this about um, how he had seen um, the what he had seen in vision, he talks about the Lamb of the Messiah being the Lamb of God. Mm, Passover is all about the Lamb, which symbolizes the Lamb of God, right? Yeah. And then the Bible tells us so. Uh, very opening verses of First Nephi. We've all read them like a thousand times. Right? Like, uh-huh. like the most familiar verses in the entire Book of Mormon, right? <laughs> I, Nephi, I haven't been born of goodly parents. So he says uh, in verse 4, um, in the commencement of the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. So when did Zedekiah's reign commence? So this is, we're, we're so familiar with, with this phrase, in the commencement of the reign of uh, the first year of the reign of Zedekiah, then we don't even really think about what it means, yeah. right? Yeah. So if you look in the Bible, how does Zedekiah's reign commence? Well, the Babylonians come in and they actually depose the previous king, Zedekiah's uncle, and they put Zedekiah in in his place. As, as the puppet, puppet king. Right? Yeah, as okay. the puppet yeah. king. And they do this, it says in the Bible, at the end of the calendar year. So we're starting a new calendar year. Well, the Jewish calendar, and actually the Babylonian calendar proves this. The Babylonian records say that they sacked, um, they sent, they did that first sack of Jerusalem at the end of the calendar year, right? Mm-hmm. So you're starting the new Jewish year with the month of Nisan. Mm-hmm. That's the Passover month, yep. right? right? So oh. anyway, you've got all kinds of other evidences that all point to the Book of Mormon is starting at Passover. So we, we put on the title page, right, the Book of Mormon, Another Testament of Jesus Christ. Then you open up the book, and it doesn't look so much like it's talking directly about Jesus. It's talking mostly about this guy, Lehi, and how his family was delivered. Unless you put it in its Passover context, yeah. right, and you see that the deliverance of Lehi's family is symbolic of yeah. the deliverance of the world by the Lamb of God. The Messiah. And honestly, that kind of helps, I think, contextualize Nephi's willingness to kill Laban. If you're thinking of the way the angel of death mm-hmm. took the firstborn in Egypt, right? Like exactly. one, it's better that one man would perish than that a nation would dwindle in unbelief, and right? That, that's actually, so that phrase that the spirit tells Nephi, that is the exact language that Caiaphas uses at Passover about mm-hmm. Jesus. And oh, it wow. actually says that even though Caiaphas is wicked, it says in the Gospel of John, he was moved on by the Spirit to, say, to that. say that, right? Yeah. And so he's making this prophecy about the Messiah, right? Well, the same idea pops up. The Spirit tells Nephi the same thing. Nephi is actually playing the role here of the Passover angel of death. Yeah. And like, whoa, and he that, just got so much more <laughs> BA. Uh-huh. Like, we that needs to be inscribed on those armbands they put on him. You know what I'm saying? Like, a- I am the symbolic angel, angel of, of death. death. Tattoos for Nephi. Yeah, kind of like your cool one, but just with like a skull and a scythe. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Straight up like Nephi. (laughs) Like, you know, I've always thought if I wanted to get a tattoo, I've always wanted to get like a BA one of like Oren Porter Rockwell and then Joseph Smith and then that sick quote that says like, no unhallowed hand can stop this work. (laughs) Calamity to made to fame. Mobs may combine. And so that way, if some, you know, Mormons that are like super orthodox look at me kind of like side eye about like, Carton, you got a tattoo. I'd be like, yeah, it's of Joseph Smith. And the angel of death verses in First <laughs> Nephi, you know, that would be pretty sick, right? Totally. Oh yeah. Yeah, we're on board. Okay, I'm glad we're all on board with this. Dude, right, that's I have a awesome. question too. Let, let's go. I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> so Nephi and Lehi both they prophesy that Jesus would come exactly 600 years after 
Lehi leaves Jerusalem, yeah. right? After their family leaves Jerusalem. Yeah. Do you think that's to the day? So it certainly seems in the text like it's intended to be. Now, hmm. um, Jerry, Jesus was born on yeah. in Passover season. Yeah. So a couple people, yeah, right. So a couple people, well, I actually make an argument based on the, um, yeah, the calendar indications in the Book of Mormon text, more of it that like supports that this happened at Passover, that like yeah. Jesus's death was at Passover, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yeah, then that Lehi's, the events with Lehi hundreds of years earlier were also at Passover. Now, Randall Spackman and Jerry Grover and others have done chronologies of the Book of Mormon, like calendars. And mm-hmm. they actually think that the, if I understand correctly, that the Nephite calendar was a lunar calendar. So yeah. mm. the years would have only had like 360 days instead of 365. And so that would mean that over time, you know, every 18 years or so, you would um, lose a year. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. um, and so, um, or, you, or you'd gain an extra year, I guess. So uh, it could be that it could, I don't know, it could be exact depending on how the years were counted or. Um, yeah, well, I got to tell you, scientists nowadays can't even agree on when the difference between B.C. and A.D. actually started. That's I mean, true. some people say that Christ was born in 6 B.C. Others say 0 Four. A.D. No, you no, know, no. Like, Ca- pardon. B.C.E. Oh, yeah. The I know, common because, era that we all know, like the thing that happened that we yeah. don't address yeah that common era yeah Yeah, it's it's pathetic it's like you know like i don't want it's the common era you know what i'm saying like it just like i hate the people that do that i'm totally editing out that insensitive reference (laughs) that was so hard i am totally i am literally writing that to 11 man like i am editing this out with a big (laughs) there's a big note there you know what i'm saying so hey card yeah so one of the big things about the Lost Pages that has gotten used against Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon okay. is the whole idea that Lucy Harris took the manuscript and burned it. This is obviously like the South Park episode, right? Like, yeah. Right. Okay. You know, uh, Lucy Harris, smart, 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 Martin Harris, dumb, right? Yeah. Um, okay. Refrain. And so uh, one of the things I've looked at, so, so in the book, the first half of the book or first third of the book is the history of the Lost Pages. So this is what do we know about like the coming forth of the Lost Pages, coming forth of the Book of Mormon more generally. The scribes for the Lost Pages, turns out Emma Smith, our girl, was the first scribe for, what, what? for the Book of Mormon, yeah. the Lost Pages, right? And we can know that from things Bummer, she, she poisoned our boy, screw um, her. <laughs> but no, I just, just <laughs> totally just kidding. What Brigham Young <laughs> kind of rumor are you repeating? <laughs> so, um, then I talk about the theft, the manuscript theft, and I look at all the sources on the manuscript theft. Okay. So a lot of people just assume it's Lucy Harris and she burns it. And so there's they use that to then discount the idea that there was some sort of conspiracy. And they mm. say Joseph Smith was just trying to dodge having to retranslate. Right? Yeah. So it turns out when I look at this, I find lots of reasons to believe Lucy Harris did not take the manuscript and burn it. Really? And one of the reasons, okay, I have a new source never been used before. Yeah. Right? Journal of William Wallace White. Okay. What a this, name. This guy, cool name. Right? Yeah. Right, like, William Wallace? Yeah. yeah. So William Wallace White, WWW. Yeah. Um, uh, anticipating the internet there. But uh, <laughs> uh, he heard Martin Harris's son, Martin Harris Jr. talk. Martin Jr. told the story of the manuscript theft as his father had, he said his father had told it to him over and over and over, right? Mm -hmm. So he related it. And he said his father actually at first suspected Lucy Harris, his wife, of having taken that manuscript, not of having burned it, but having hidden it or something. And then the wife, she dies young. She dies at the age of 40 in 1836. Yeah, didn't you say it was like on her deathbed? On she, her deathbed. See, I did read your book. On her deathbed, <laughs> she says she did, did not yeah. know what had happened to that manuscript, that she didn't know anything about it. Oh, okay? really? She was a Quaker, now, right? In She was a Quaker, okay? And in Quakerism, you are not supposed to swear an oath ever because everything you say is supposed to be as if you were under oath. Mm. Now, in the 19th century, I actually just found this out from an attorney, but like 
in the 19th century um, and up until actually like the 1970s or something, deathbed testimony was admissible in court wow. because it was assumed that when you were dying, when you were about to go meet God, you would not lie. Mm. And so here we have a devout Quaker whose whole religious faith tells her, like, you never lie. Yeah. Right? And then on her deathbed, she's saying, what me? I don't, I don't know what happened to those. That totally convinced Martin Harris, even though the two of them were estra- completely estranged for yeah. like eight years. Yeah. He became, when he heard that from his kids, he became totally convinced, well, then it wasn't her. It couldn't have been her. Yeah. Wow. So do we know who it was or have a clue? So we do have clues. So we have suspects, right? And okay. I spend part of my chapter four is I like going through, I've got 40 some odd sources about the theft. And then Whoa. I've got like um, some suspects. So one of the suspects would be the Harris's son-in-law. They had a son-in-law, Flanders Dyke. Never liked him. Never oh, liked him. <laughs> he sounds suspicious yep. just by he's, his he's name. He's toast, man. <laughs> he's toast. We got <laughs> so that guy... Two years after the manuscript disappears, there's a notice in the newspaper that says Flanders Dyke has skipped town with a thousand dollars of other people's goods and money. What? Okay. And then several years later, there's something about him escaping from jail that's in the newspaper. Okay. Uh huh. And the newspaper article also says he came from a family of swindlers, and it lists the various swindles that like his father and his brothers had done in the couple years before that. Well, we've got indication from Lucy Max Smith that this guy at one point had stolen the Anthem transcript. Really? So we already know that he's stealing documents related to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Why wouldn't he have stolen the lost pages? He might yeah. I love 1800s right? newspapers where you could just cast aspersions on people <laughs> just <laughs> randomly. Like all of these anti-Mormons that we know have done all these heinous things and abuses and so on and so forth, but are like hidden behind this weird shroud of verifiable academia or whatever and plausible and, deniability, and, and, plausible deniability yeah. and probability. Imagine if we could just write that. Oh, we all know X is just a bad <laughs> person and comes from a long line of swindlers you know that would be just in, absolutely in your pre-internet awesome. life this is what you would have been you would have been one of those newspaper editors. oh i would That's be a, a, a muckraker par excellence <laughs> yeah no i'm just kidding i would have gone out Ward with orrin newspaper. porter rockwell Ward newspaper <laughs> no i would have been out there with orrin porter rockwell yeah no ward newsletter newsletter yeah. you know what i'm saying dog so ward expositor no i, yeah, I am <laughs> loving this though the the stuff that you're talking about that we can guess and see right. was in the last 116 right. pages because of the depth that that adds to the story of the Book of Mormon, which to me, I don't know, for, for me, thinking about having written a book myself now, that level of depth, holy crap, that yeah. Joseph Smith would have just made that up, like that adds even more to my testimony that like, yeah, no, Joseph Smith didn't just come up with the Book of Mormon on his own here. Nor anyone else. Yeah. yeah. There's so many interesting, deep parallels that's like, even if you give the guy years to be planning this all at once and then like to just dictate it, even if he had co-authors, which actually would have made it harder. It like it, I don't know. It, it just adds so much to me that like this is a divinely inspired book. So I got a question for you, man, because, yeah. um, you know, we're, unfortunately, we're going to have a hard out here in like five minutes. OK. Um, was there anything that you researched mm-hmm. in doing your homework for this book? OK, that just really blew your mind or blew to pieces any of these anti-Mormon arguments that we're constantly getting levied at us. You know, one of the biggest things that people like about our channel, uh, whether they're Brighamites, Bickertonites, you know, Strangites, whatever, all manner of <laughs> ites, you know, they they love the debunkings that we do of some of these really just cruel and cynical and toxic anti-Mormons, right? Um, was there anything that when you were doing research for this, you just thought like, oh, whoa, this blows this theory out of the water. And, and I have a feeling Brad's going to answer the question for you. I mean, just <laughs> while, while you're thinking of your response, I, I I feel like what you already mentioned about the like the details of what went on with Martin's actual loss of the 116 pages is so much deeper 
than the way it gets portrayed in the media. Like, but the, he was just a con man. Like, he was just, and there was like an affidavit somewhere that somebody wrote that he was a bad person. Like the ridiculous <laughs> yeah. oversimplification of that South yeah. Park episode of dum 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 dum. Like that isn't even close to the way that it went down. They just put in all of this like oh this was what everyone's intents were and it's so clear and it's like no they left out so many important details by the way i love how josh is like boxing out i am ready and to you know in, he's like not he's josh. my place he's, he, he's boxing <laughs> people out he's like established like, i'm it. next i'm next baby <laughs> you know okay but yeah I, I think that that alone is a huge huge refutation of a lot of the anti-arguments we already get yet yeah, well go and, ahead, and Josh. to to piggyback on that at ten thousand feet to oversimplify don's book but like one of my takeaways while i was reading through it was the fact that okay we have another manuscript tied to the golden plates that are coming forth with multiple independent attestation from non-believers and believers alike right. uh -huh. okay so you have when you look at the biblical manuscripts, we go back and we're 150 years in before you get a little piece of a thing that came from a garbage dump that has a little bit of Matthew and another one that has a little bit of John. And here we have a third manuscript that brings us into the halls of the room where the Book of Mormon is coming forth. And so for me, the evidence that Don brings out of both the details and the context of the story validates the fact that we actually did have a manuscript with, as Don argues, over 116 pages. Mm. And with that, it is a third manuscript tied directly to the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, which is an unbelievably strong evidence for its existence and the existence of the Golden Plates. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. Dude, his mic drop was almost better than yours, dog. Almost. It was like a close second. It was a box you know. So now, yeah. now, Don, you've got to beat it. Yeah, okay. dude, for real. So, so it came up earlier that uh, Brad and Sean and their books, their books both have dragons in them, and that makes me feel like I need a second edition. <laughs> Throw it in, yeah. Throw it in. yeah. The, the dragons in the lock. No, call it call right? it the like, fool's that's cap him. dragon. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's what Kareelums <laughs> were, right? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kareelums, Kareelums, the Q-Mobs were dragons. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>